Good morning, Solid Ground. Welcome online. Nice to um, join you. What an amazing video, hey? Gee, the creativity in our church is unbelievable. I'm so awestruck by that awesome video. Thank you to uh, the staff who put that together. Isn't that special, hey? Happy Father's Day to all our dads this morning. We love you and appreciate you and uh, all of your actions towards your children's go noticed by the Father who is in heaven. And uh, I believe God's blessing is upon you. And I pray that uh, God continue to give you courage and wisdom as dads. Um, come join us right after the service at uh, 10 a.m. We have a coffee drive through to celebrate Father's Day. And uh, what you're going to do is you're going to come park uh, in our solid ground parking spot, get out your car, come grab a free cappuccino. We also have a, uh, a little gift for each of the men and a little treat uh, just to fatten you up in the winter months. And then, uh, and then you, there's, a, there's a Father's Day photo booth even, so you can grab a family photo, um, say hi for a few minutes, and then you'll exit and make your way back home. So good excuse to get out the house this morning. Amen. Hey, before we get going... Um, I just want to pray for our church. Um, we have a very dear family member, uh, Vanessa Wilson, who um, is in hospital at the moment with COVID and uh, has really been through a rough time. And we want to pray for God's healing and protection over her. And um, maybe uh, you know someone this morning or maybe... Um, someone we haven't mentioned necessarily in church circles is sick and you want to lift them up in prayer. We want to pray for all those right now that are not doing well and trust for God's miraculous healing power. So let's close our eyes together and pray to our Father who is in heaven. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that we can come to you with anything and with everything, with all our stresses, our anxieties, our requests, our needs. And thank you that we can come to you on behalf of others, Lord. Thank you that you hear our prayer, that you interact with us, that you respond, and that you give us good gifts, Lord, and you intervene, and you bring breakthrough and healing, and you have miraculous power that is unmatched and unlimited in every single way. Uh, you create life, you sustain life, and we believe you this morning that you are God, God of creation, God of the heavens and the earth, God over our lives. And I want to bring our friends to you. I want to pray specifically for Vanessa Wilson this morning. In Jesus' name, as a church family, we pray that you would heal her mightily, Lord God. That she would be um, uh, on a road to recovery from this moment on. That there would be a miraculous improvement to her situation. And we commit her into your hands knowing that, Lord, you look over her and you are with her. Even when her family can't be at her side right now, Jesus, you are with her right now. Lord, we pray for each and every single person who is um, battling through this reality of COVID in whatever way, whether sick themselves or family members or even maybe facing uh, the, just the, the, the grief of losing a loved one in this time. I want to pray your comfort and your peace into every heart this morning. May we be a people full of joy. May we have no fear this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, turn with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 8, and uh, we're going to be reading a short passage this morning from verses 14 to 17. So get your fingers on your Bible there. I would like to um, speak to you this morning on biblical sonship. Uh, fitting for Father's Day, I believe, and I'll let you know why in a moment. Um, you probably think that on a Father's Day we should be highlighting fathers, but I want to highlight sons and what biblical sonship means. You know, adoption... For me, as I survey the truth of God's word and the reality of the fulfillment of all of his word in Christ Jesus, the highlight of Christian salvation, the good news, the gospel, is adoption. I cannot think of any higher privilege than being called a son of God or a daughter of God. In the New Testament, um, mostly Paul writes about this matter, but in every letter you'll see that m most often uh, this idea of adoption is expressed in a masculine uh, term uh, of sonship. Um, but even though it's expressed as sonship, you can uh, be fully assured that it is um, meant for sons and daughters equally the same, applicable to male and female. Uh, why all the masculine language around this idea of uh, adoption in the New Testament? 
Um, why is it so often that we are referred to be, uh, as being called the sons of God and not the sons and daughters of God? I mean, was Paul leaving the woman out? No, he, he, he wasn't. Um, he, was in, he was fully meaning that this had um, full implication to men and women. But I think one of the reasons for masculine language to describe our status as children of God is because um, of the cultural norms of the day in which the New Testament was written. If you think about Roman and Jewish society in which we find the New Testament letters circulating, um, it's well documented in, in Roman society that women were classified as second-rate citizens. They, they didn't have a right to vote um, or hold any political office. And similarly to the Jews, um, daughters were not really viewed as favor, favorable um, because they didn't carry on the family name. And so it was more favorable to have sons. And we know from historically that there was a practice of infanticide, which is basically um, putting your baby out to die because you um, don't like the child you've given birth to, um, which was a horrible thing that happened in Roman society. And most often this would take, the pla t take place when daughters were born um, because to have a son brought honor and prestige and uh, possibly could further your political power or your societal power. And as well as um, girls were kind of at the bottom end when it came to the handing out of inheritances in family life, which was similar to Jewish society. Um, in Jewish society, um, sons stood in line to inherit, and only if there was no more sons or no male descendants or no male uncle or someone that had a right to the father's inheritance, eventually then the daughter could maybe inherit something of the father's property when he died. So they really stood last in line. And uh, the beautiful thing about why all the masculine language, we were talking about us as being children of God and why the Bible refers to all of us, male and female, as sons of God, I think is because we all in Christ have equal right to the inheritance. And we all have equal position and equal value as sons would in the, in, in the, in the day that Paul was writing into. Men and women enjoy that in Christ equally first in line to inherit, all carry the benefit of the sons, both as men and women. We need to learn how to live under a perfect father. When I refer uh, to sons this morning, you can say, and daughters as well. But we all come under the privilege of the firstborn son in Christ. Isn't that amazing? Why talk about sonship on Father's Day? Well, I believe that we are poor fathers because we are poor sons. We don't know how to receive from our Father who is in heaven, and we don't know how to live under a perfect Father. And I believe that great sons will make great fathers. Amen. Let's read Romans chapter 8. For all those led by God's Spirit are God's sons. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, Instead, you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. And if children, also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. Let's pray over God's word this morning. Lord, your word is precious it is unfailing, it is truthful, there is no mistake. And we commit ourselves to your word this morning and ask you, Holy Spirit, to come and convict our hearts by the power of your word. And I ask in Jesus' name that you'd anoint me this morning to preach your word with boldness. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to give you six truths about sonship from Romans chapter 8, verses 14 to 17. For all those led by God's Spirit are God's sons. Six truths of sonship. The first truth you need to know about biblical sonship is no fear. No fear. How many of you live in fear? Fear of punishment. Fear of doing wrong. Fear of failure. Fear of being robbed. Fear of everything being taken away from you. Fear, fear of losing something precious. Fear of your kids. Fear of your finances. Fear of your future. Biblical sonship in Christ means all those fears are taken away. You do not have to fear. It is not the responsible thing to do to fear. That's not the way that God wants you to walk out your life. He doesn't want you to fear. He has given you every reason 
not to fear. It's interesting to note, it says in verse 15, for you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. So fear has got to do with a spirit of slavery. We don't come under a spirit of slavery in Christ. We come under a spirit of sonship. Spirit of slavery, let's think about that for a moment. How would masters exert their authority over slaves? Through fear. If you disobey, you'll get punished. If you run away, you'll be punished. If you don't do the thing the way I want it to be done, you'll be punished. And that's how masters would exert authority over slaves. is through fear, and particularly fear of punishment. How many of us actually act towards God in this manner? We spend our lives fearing God in the wrong sense of the word. Fearing God's punishment. Fearing that God wants to take things away from us. Fearing that God's plans for us are bad. Fearing that God just wants to make our life a life of misery and pain. Fear that is uncalled for. And God says, you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fears, into fear. Instead, you have received the spirit of adoption. Romans 8.31 says, what then are we to say about these things? This is the end of this chapter, summarizing all these great truths of what it means to be a son of God or a daughter of God in Christ. Paul says, what are we to say about these things? Number one, if God is for us, who can be against us? So we don't have to fear any man. We don't fear death. We don't fear punishment for our past. We don't fear God's wrath on sin. We don't fear people's opinion. We don't fear the future. We don't fear for our kids. No fear. Are you living in no fear? That's the kind of sonship that Christ has called us into. Romans 8.37 says, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Last week in church, in the ministry moment, I said to everyone, with God as our Father, we cannot fail. And there was a dead silence in the church hall. And I realized that even for myself, I had to think about what I said and ask myself, do I truly believe that in Christ, that our destiny is not failure, but we are more than conquerors? At every turn, at every trial, at every stumbling point even, even when we make mistakes, we actually walk in the victory of Christ. And we can live with the banner of victory. We are more than conquerors. We cannot fail. We cannot fail. Say, I cannot fail. I cannot fail. Yes, we can make mistakes. Yes, we can sin. But in Christ, actually, His victory is covered over every single mistake, every single failure, past, present, and future. And through Him, He works all things together for the good, and He brings us into His fullness of His victory. The second truth that I want you to know about biblical sonship is that you're adopted. You have received the spirit of adoption. J.I. Packer says this, adoption is the highest privilege of the gospel. The traitor is forgiven. He's brought in for supper and given the family name. To be right with God, the judge, is a great thing, but to be loved and cared for by God the Father is greater. And this is what you and I are who are in Christ. When we get adopted, your name changes. I know a couple of adopted children I know Matthew Rutten in Canada, adopted by Leonard and Laurie Rutten. When he was adopted, his name changed. He received the family name, Rutten. I know Eli and Ezra Cox in Cape Town, adopted by my friends Adam and Alison Cox. When they were adopted, their name changed, their status changed, their household changed, their identity changed. You know how amazing it is to have your father's identity? Some of you know that I've been building a house recently. Sorry if you're tired of my stories about my house, but it's almost finished. Please, Lord. My dad has built many things in Middleburg, homes, church buildings. And so he has a reputation with many people who he's done business with in the past. And all I have to do when I deal with some of the suppliers or the contractors is pick up the phone and say, Hi, I'm James Lennox, Graham Lennox's son. And immediately there's instant credibility and authority. And this is the way it is with us as children of God. Hello, I'm Linda Matalengwe, and my father is the God who created the heavens and the earth. And immediately Satan and all his demons shudder because you carry the, the, the authority of your father who is in heaven. The third thing I want you to know about biblical sonship 
is intimacy. That's closeness. That's relational connectedness in such a deep and beautiful way. Verse 15 says, the spirit of adoption in us, the Holy Spirit, cries out, Abba, Father, constantly, daily, hourly, nightly, in our times of great success and in our times of deep, deepest, darkest sorrow, the Spirit continually reminds us and cries out on our behalf, Abba, Father. Have you ever been in trouble and just found yourself praying to God and saying, Father, Dad, it's the Holy Spirit in you, at work in you, biblical sonship coming through again and again and again. I remember going to my friends, Adam and Alison Cox, recently to visit them in Cape Town when I was visiting Adrian and Antoinette Quinlivet at Cedars Church, and I hadn't seen Eli and Ezra, Ezra who've been adopted um, in the, uh, by them, and um, they're about three and four years old now, if I'm not mistaken, and it was mind-blowing the first time I saw them, well, last time I saw them was when they were quite a lot younger, Ezra was in fact a baby, and now to see the two of them just call out to their dad from the play park outside, hey dad, get me my fire truck, please. Intimacy, adoption. My friend didn't adopt those children for them to say, Mr. Cox, may I please go to the bathroom now? He adopted them so they could cry out from the play park while he's inside busy and say, Dad, please get me my fire truck. That's the kind of intimacy that we have with our father. In fact, it's the kind of intimacy that our father desires to have with us. And that's why the spirit of adoption cries out in you and I, Abba, Father. In a Jewish home, you don't call anyone Abba. You call your dad Abba. So in an Afrikaans home, you say Pa or Papa. In an English home, you say Dad. What do you say in a Zulu household? Baba. These words are referred for an intimate relationship between the son or the daughter and the father alone. And this is what God has willed for our lives, that we would call him by that intimate name. Papa, Dad, Baba, Abba. The fourth thing about biblical sonship is assurance. Verse 16 says, The Spirit Himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. Rory Dyer says that the big spirit, Holy Spirit, is telling the small spirit, my spirit, daily, hourly, that I am God's son. You are God's son. You are God's son. You are God's son. Say, I am God's son. I am God's daughter. That's what the Big spirit, big capital S, is telling the small spirit, you and I, every day. But you know what happens? We flip it around, and our little spirit starts to tell things back to God. I'm not good enough. I don't think I've pleased you. I'm, 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 I'm worried about my life. I'm, you know, and we start to dictate to God how our relationship should to go. And the, the capital S spirit, Holy Spirit, is telling you all the time, you are loved. You are my son. I am with you. Do not fear. Do not grumble. Do not be dismayed. Do not worry. You are my son. We tend to think that salvation, that my spirituality, my devotion, my, my spiritual life should be dictating and telling God, this is why you should save me. But that's not biblical salvation. Biblical salvation is the Holy Spirit testifying to your spirit that you are saved once and forever. And I've said this before, friends, and I believe it 100% is the biblical message of the gospel, once saved, always saved. You can fight me on it. You can try to find reasons for it. People always come to me and say, what about the backslider? I say, he's a naughty son who's being naughty. He's, he's being naughty. Have you not read the passage of the prodigal son? Did he at any point not become a son anymore? He was always a son, even in the pigsty. He wasn't at home, but he was a son. And the story ends with the father and the son united. And I believe in once saved, always saved. God didn't put Jesus on the cross and then expect us to do the other 5%. We were not capable of doing point naught, 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 five percent So if God did it, is he not good enough to finish his work? If salvation is all about God's work alone, then at what point can my work disrupt his work? Once a child, always a child of God. Once a son, always a son. You want your life to be changed then you should understand the gospel from the biblical viewpoint because it will give you assurance. Assurance will lead to, lead to shalom or wholeness or peace. You need assurance. You cannot live a life of thinking that by my actions, I am attaining salvation in God's eyes. That is every other religion. That, then you must go to Buddhism, Hinduism, whatever 
ism you want to turn to. But that's every, grace is unique to the gospel. The unmerited favor of God alone. God has called you. God has adopted you. God has set you apart. God has redeemed you. The fifth important thing to understand about biblical sonship is inheritance. Verse 17 in Romans 8 says that if we are children, then we are heirs. Now, how many of you have wished that you were maybe, um, um, not so much Harry and Meghan, but what's the other guy? William and Kate, because they've been good royal sons. I don't know if he's exactly the heir to the throne. I think his, his dad first, Charles. But um, how many of you wished, hey, I imagine I was heir to like a magnificent inheritance, say, hey? Imagine I was the duke or the duchess of something, or imagine I was, you know, in line to be the Zulu king, in, 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 inheriting the beautiful mountains of KwaZulu Natal and all that land, and wouldn't that be amazing? I'd love that. But in Christ, we are heirs, and not just to KZN or Great Britain or whatever. We are heirs with Christ, and what is Christ the heir of? The new creation, the kingdom. We are co-heirs with Christ. Part of our inheritance is the fact that we live in the undeserved favor of God daily. We live in His love. We live with His truth. We can hear God. We can walk with Him. We walk in His favor, in His anointing, His opportunities before us. But here's the reality of inheritance, is that if we don't receive it, believe it, walk in it, then actually we miss out on the reward of our inheritance. Colossians 3.23 says, whatever you do, do it from the heart as something done for the Lord and not for people. Knowing that you will receive the reward of an inheritance from the Lord. The reward of an inheritance. What's the reward of an inheritance? It's the benefit of an inheritance. Someone can phone me up today and say, I don't know if you knew this, but you have a castle in Scotland, which I'm praying for daily because I'm a Lennox and apparently... Maybe there's that opportunity one day. I'm kidding. There's probably never going to be that. But um, you have a castle in Scotland. I can go stand on that land and I can live the same old impoverished life. But if I receive it and I do something with it and I enjoy the benefit of it, I live in the castle. I work the land and I enjoy the fruit of the land and I actually make something of it. I enjoy the reward of my inheritance. Many Christians are not walking around living in the benefit of their inheritance because they're not trusting God. How, how do we come into our inheritance? How do we receive the reward of it? So we, we, we have been saved. We have been made co-heirs with Christ. We have access to God's throne room. We can pray, but how many of us are not praying? How many of us are not asking? If everything in the kingdom comes by asking, how little do you have because of your prayer life? Are you walking in the benefit of your inheritance? Are you acting like a son? Are you acting like a slave or a stranger to God? Are you bold to ask God? Or are you shrinking back to ask God? I was going to say, be a son and a daughter with all boldness and enjoy your inheritance. It's not a trick uh, thing. It's not like this challenge like who gets to live in the benefit of the inheritance. Ooh, 10 steps to try to figure it out and maybe you will, maybe you won't. No, this is very plain and simple. Trust God and turn from evil. Proverbs 3 tells us. Pro you want to live in your inheritance? I mean, one passage I can point you to is Proverbs 3, verse 1 to 12. Let's, let's read vi verse 5 to 10 and see how little it is about really being clever or smart or knowing a lot of stuff or knowing the right people. To walk in God's inheritance is quite simple, friends. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not rely on your own understanding. You are not as clever as you think you are. A beautiful benefit of being a son in the Father's house is that we rely on His wisdom, not our own. In all your ways, know Him. So many of us are familiar with that text, and it says, in all your ways, acknowledge Him, and I think that's 100% right, but this says it so beautiful, beautifully in the CSB, in all your ways, know Him. That is, be conscious of the Lord God and communicate with Him through everything. Even when you feel like your prayer is weak and powerless, just to talk to God, just to just to consciously know him in every single decision and turn and parenting and business opportunity and this and that and the next thing. Rely not on your own understanding. Lean on God wholeheartedly. Trust him. 
Don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. So respect the Lord. Respect his word. Respect his boundaries. They're good for you. Respect his do's and his do nots. That's not what he's all about. In fact, he actually has so much more than a list of rules for us. But anytime he does command something that says do or do not, it's because he loves us and it's for our benefit and it will protect us and bring us into the full benefit of our inheritance which we already have in Christ. The sixth and last thing that we see from this passage about biblical sonship is suffering. One other word we can use for that is discipline. And this might sound like a negative, but let's just think about it and we'll realize that God's got a mighty plan even in this reality of sonship. If we indeed suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. So we will enjoy the benefit of our inheritance. We enjoy, the, we enjoy salvation entirely on the basis of the work of God. I, I, see, I see our salvation as tied to one thing, Jesus on the cross. Your salvation is tied to nothing else other than what Jesus did on the cross. I see our reward of inheritance. You could almost say it's like this bonus, this extra, this beautiful um, privilege of sons over and above just being rescued is this reward of inheritance. And I see this tied to two things. Number one, our adoption. So we're sons and daughters, so we, we, we are co-heirs of an inheritance set aside for us by our Father. And number two, our obedience. So this is, you can lose out on the reward of your inheritance. This is the reality. You can squander what God has done in your life. You will still be saved, but you can stand before Him and you won't hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. And once again, we should not overcomplicate. How do I stand before Jesus one day and know that I will hear his words? Well done, good and faithful servant. Well, you just persist in faith. You just keep trusting God. You just throw off offenses. You just turn from evil. Even if it takes your whole lifetime to gain mastery over one persistent sin in your life, you keep doing it. You don't You don't close yourself off from God. You don't dull uh, your hearing to His voice. You keep opening. You keep repenting. You keep forgiving. You keep living. You keep trusting. You keep hoping. You keep loving. Even when those you love in return hate you or anger you or, or hurt you. And I guarantee you, if you do the simple thing of persisting in just believing God, and believing his word, and growing in the knowledge of God, you will come into your full benefit of the inheritance that God has apportioned for you in Christ. The Lord disciplines the one he loves, just as a father disciplines the son in whom he delights. Hebrews 12 verse 7 says, endure suffering as discipline. God is dealing with you as sons. So when you go through hard times in life, friends, like many of us are going through now, Endure it as sons and daughters, not as slaves, not as strangers, as sons. Life is tough right now. Finances are tough right now. There's not enough money at the end of the month. God, I'm a son. God, I'm a daughter. God, I receive this trial. Whatever you're teaching me, I'm open to it. I want it. Discipline me. Make me like Christ. Lord, teach me. I receive this trial as a gift. I receive your discipline as a gift. I I receive the rebuke of a friend, a godly friend, as a gift. I receive the correction of my boss as a gift. Even an ungodly man, God can use them to discipline us. I receive it as a gift. Some of us are too proud, so we don't receive the discipline of the Lord, so we don't become like Christ, so we don't enjoy the benefit of our inheritance. Two things. Number one, God disciplines us on the basis of our future, not our past. So when God is disciplining us, he's not saying, you bad boy, you keep doing this wrong thing. What a wrong thing you've done. Look at the bad thing you've done. Look at your past. You're a failure. You're useless. He's saying, I have a preferred future for you. So what I'm doing right now is setting you up for a preferred future. And that's how fathers and mothers should discipline their children. It's always on the basis of their future, not on the basis of their past. And the second thing is that Hebrews, we get that from Hebrews 12. It says, 
No discipline seems enjoyable at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So later on, in the future, it yields fruit. So God's always disciplining us on the basis of a beautiful future. The second thing is Hebrews 5, verse 8 to 9. Although he was a son, speaking of Jesus, he learned obedience from what he suffered. After he was perfected, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Rory Dyer says, and he's mentioned this before, that when he was diagnosed with a brain tumor, which he still has, and he still has severe headaches as a result, he realized that through that suffering, he became a source to other people. So through suffering, Christ became a source of salvation. So we're not Jesus, we're not going to become a source of salvation, but we can become a source of compassion, a source of God's love, a source of understanding, a source of sympathy. And so Rory Dyer walks into a room, and he's told the story in Solid Ground before, but he walks into a room, and other people who are sick and bending over under the oppression of having a backache or whatever, he can identify with them, and he can minister to them with greater power and authority, because he, through his suffering, he has become a source for those people. I want to encourage you this morning as we close to live as a son, not as a slave. No fear. Say no fear. In solid ground church, there is no fear. The words of your life by our Father in heaven is have no fear, my son, have a go. But Lord, I don't know if this is your perfect will. Have a go, my son. Have a go. Go for it. Trade with your money. Go for that property. Give generously to the church. Oh, but what? Go have a go. If only you saw it from my perspective. Sometimes I just needed to hear that. Playing rugby on the side of the field, Keith Daniels and my father came to watch me many times. And I was sometimes having the worst game of my life. But every time I got the boy, there was just these shots from these two men on the side of the field, one a friend and one my father. Go for it, James! Have a go! Great job! And for many of us, we don't think that God shouts over our life like that. And so I want to encourage you to live as sons because it will make you great fathers. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word this morning. And I pray this for every man and woman in this place that we would receive the spirit of sonship fully and finally in our lives because of what Christ has done for us on the cross. In you, we cannot fail. In you we have no fear. In you we are adopted. In you we have intimacy with our fathers in heaven. And in you we walk through suffering, but it's all for a reason. And it's all for our future. And we have a glorious future because we have an inheritance. We are co-heirs with Christ. I pray that this word would sink deep into our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, solid ground. Have a wonderful Sunday. Get in your car. Let's have coffee together between 10 and 11 in our coffee drive-thru. Amen.